Oh, but you're the one who's talking. Who's talking? Is that a clock? I don't know. Is that a real clock? That's probably oh. Dale. She's going to give us like. The doors are shut down. That's the sign. She's going to give us warning. Not warning. Right. Hello. Is it working? Do I sound all right? Okay. I am not very accustomed to holding one of these things, so I apologize in advance for when it cuts out or my voice sounds funny or anything else. So, but hi, I'm Ryan. See, you did it. I knew I'd do it. Uh, Ryan Keck, I work for the Center for Policing Excellence. I know a number of folks in the room and those that I don't. Hi, again. Um, Center for Policing Excellence is housed at DPSST. So just as a little bit of background to say who we are, I'll throw that out there. Um, DPST, statewide training academy, regulatory academy, or regulatory uh, body for police, public safety, at all. And then in 2013, they created the Center for Policing Excellence. Before I talk a little bit more about why and what we do, or at least do one of these. Hi. Um, so my name is Stacy Utzi, and I work with Ryan at the Center for Policing Excellence. And uh, I'm I guess new-ish to the team. I joined that team in May and prior to that I was in a different position at the Academy. And so I kind of come to this team with a background and a passion for evidence-based practices. I come with a background in uh, juvenile justice. So uh, we talk about kind of the, the title of this uh, whole summit being about what works. And that's a language that, um, that I'm pretty familiar with, that we've spoke for a long time in the field of juvenile justice. And so I'm excited to have came on board with this team where we're trying to kind of raise awareness and bring that to other aspects of public safety as well. So I'm the storyteller, and she's the brains, right? And then there's a lot more brains up here with C CP as well and other partners that have brains. I just get to tell stories. So in 2013, underneath House Bill 3194 and Justice Reinvestment, there was a sliver, a sliver of that that was carved out in legislation to say, you know what, we need to think about how we promote evidence-based policing specifically. So Oregon's had a great history of using evidence basis and looking to research to inform what it does but it's really focused on the back end of the system and so they carved out a little bit to say well what about the front end there are things we've learned now 20 years have gone by and then some to figure out how policing can kind of divert folks from going to jail prison in the first place how we can improve or prevent livability concerns in our communities mitigate fear and develop trust trust, confidence in our communities that support the work that public safety uh, officials, practitioners do. So we were fortunate. They carved that little piece out. They said, you know, the place for that to start is probably in training. We've got to make people aware. So DPSST maybe is the right place to do that, and we'll create this body, this Center for Policing Excellence, who, again, in a nutshell, was asked to promote the use of research, data, and evaluation as well as then encourage or develop partnerships with researchers or between researchers and practitioners. And so away we went. There were two of us initially. Now there are nine of us. And what we've worked to do is kind of exactly that, start building an awareness. And so I gotta find a clicker. We start, of course, with a vision. And we broadened our vision from the get-go. It's not just about leadership. So when we were first started, they'd plug in some language and say, well, let's hit those leaders. Let's make sure those executives know what this is all about. Make sure that the supervisors know what this is all about. And we tried that, or we've, we do that, and I can talk about that. But we recognize everybody's got to get on board with something like evidence-based policing or evidence-based practices. And it can't just be the top-level executive. It can't just be the middle manager. Everybody in an organization has got to be on board, and they've got to be applying research, data, and evaluation. Yeah, but what for? Right, that's the question. Well, why? So we helped kind of define that as well. What we want to see is that services contribute to public value. Right? We don't just want to be effective. Now, that sounds cool, but doing what? Well, contributing to public value. And that's a flip, and it's, and it's a uh, really a what's the word? homage to the people that we serve. Right? We sometimes, in policing, I'll use particularly, we think of the things that 
public value. And we say, well, they, need more. they want us to arrest more people. They want more of us out on the street. And they want us to meet with them more and talk to them a lot. Well, what we find out and what research tends to point out is that kind of, but not really, they'd prefer that they are never victimized by crime. Right? Therefore, they don't really see you. They feel safe in their community, but they trust and they have confidence that if you're there, you'll do what you need to do. Right? You'll protect the innocent. You'll take care of those that are not. And then they can go about the lives that they choose to lead. So there's a little bit of flip there, a paradigm shift to say, wait, it's about what the public wants, what the community needs, and how we serve them. And then we want to continue to get better at that. That's where that research piece comes back in, that wonderful world of academia where they're constantly trying to figure things out, get a little bit better. Something happens, it really worked, but why did it work, and could we make it even better? We want the same in our justice system. As we're constantly, continuously improving the system in here, here in Oregon. The uh, word we like to use is constructively discontent, right, is what we're looking for. Staying with the public value for a second and those kind of three pieces that we talk about, you, what you get then is this categorization. There's control of crime and there's community trust. And what we've seen is kind of pendulums swinging over the courses of history, right? We will sometimes put a lot of effort into the control of crime and we get really good at it. And while we're doing that, we kind of lose that community trust piece. And we go, oh gosh, that's a big problem. We need to take care of that. And we put a lot of effort into community trust. We build a lot of bridges. And we kind of forget about some of the things that we might use to control crime. And so the pendulum keeps swinging back and forth and back and forth. And while we're leaning towards one side or the other, we may be focusing on what we think will work. And we kind of stumble our way through what is kind of working but as we start to swing back the other way to cover the other thing, we don't capture it. We're not sure that it did. And so we forget about it. Right? So the piece of evidence-based helps us capture some of that. It helps guide it, and then it helps capture it by looking to what is working. Let's evaluate what we're doing, and let's use all of that to learn and improve as we move forward. And so a big part of our goal is to cover both of these pieces and bring them together. We have, well, we'll talk about it a little bit later, so I won't get too far ahead, but you have these cycles. We, we repeat or we revisit certain issues in our communities, but we sometimes don't recognize that um, you know, bo if we had handled both con dynamics at the same time, if we dealt with crime control, if we dealt with trust together, maybe we could avoid it a little better. So this becomes the difficulty I'll let you talk a little bit about that. So like Ryan already mentioned that uh, what is, what's really been discovered over the last several years is that there's, there's a place for research at the table with public safety period. And we've seen it in other disciplines creeping in, but we're starting to see it uh, maybe take off a little bit more uh, with policing. We've definitely seen it in community corrections. Uh, like I said, when I came from uh, juvenile justice, it had definitely taken off there. And so this is something that, that we at the Center for Police and Excellence are trying to, uh, to help further. And we do this through kind of a, a, a multi-tiered concept that we'll get to here, I think, on the next slide. But, um, but this is basically sort of what Ryan was, uh, was talking about, where there, that there's research out there, and we're going to kind of cover all these, I think, in more detail. So. So this is sort of the approach that we're using at, uh, at CPE. There's different levels of uh, engagement in evidence-based practices that we're trying to further. And the area that we really hover around mostly right now is kind of this bottom of the pyramid, sort of this introduction or this no. And uh, there's a lot of research out there-ish, and uh, we're going to talk more about kind of where do you find that research? Where do you find those good... Uh, research partnerships if you don't have uh, a contract with Steve James. So there are other sources out there and, uh, and we're going to hit on some of those. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how we can be a resource to you guys in your agencies to help you find this research, uh, to help you translate it, to help make it uh, usable and, and digestible for you guys. And then what's the next step with it is how do you, uh, how do you further your training on, on a subject? So you get a research document that may be, you know, 45 pages. 45? That's a good length of a research paper. 
a good research one? So how do you translate that and make it so that it's usable by, by you guys in your agencies? And one of the ways that we do that is, uh, is by making it into a training that you guys could either come to at uh, DPSST or even better, that you'll send somebody to a train the trainer with us and then you will take it back to your agency and that you will continue uh, to further that in the field. So kind of this uh, bottom level of no is sort of where we hover around. Uh, the next stage of that would be do. We want you to, to take something that you've learned, take this new skill, take this concept, and we want you to try it. We want you guys to try something in your agency, in real life, and then we want to be there to support you when, while you guys are doing this. So uh, how did it work? Can we help you uh, in any way sort of evaluate the success of whether something worked for you or not? And we want to be that, uh, that support to kind of help you move through it. Um, Obviously, the, the kind of ultimate goal and what uh, goes right along with sort of the, the vision of CPE was in the end, we'd like our agencies or constituents to be something. We'd like you to embody this, this uh, belief of evidence-based practices that this, this thing works for you and that the constituents across the state and across public safety disciplines are actually doing this and embodying this in the field. You want to say anything else about that one? So, kind of starting point for us, and it's uh, kind of weird how things align the way they did, but how many folks have seen the document on the right? So the President's Task Force Report, 21st Century Policing. A couple of you? Okay. Right. So just after um, Ferguson incidents, uh, just after CPE was um, created or in incepted, is that a word? I don't know. But when we, after we just started getting to work, those incidents happened, President Obama called this commission together and they put together what ultimately was 156 recommendations on how to strengthen uh, policing in our country. Ways in which federal and state local level practitioners could work primarily to build back trust. And here we are, the pendulum. Trust is the thing we got to focus in on. Now, it was a good document. In fact, it was a great recommendations uh, kind of through and through. We had the opportunity to share and provide testimony on that commission as well to speak to what training maybe could do, what it should include, um, how ways in which to be effective with it. But historically, the problem being is that this isn't the first time we've had something like this. Right? There, so there's been a, there was a current commission after the civil rights. There were documents like this after um, Rodney King in, in those times, and so then we had, you know, the, the kind of the blossoming of community oriented policing as a thing or a model. And here we are now in the, in the late, in the late, you know, 2014, 15 ish era, and now we've got President's Task Force report. But right, this time we then got something to go with it. Now, how many of you are familiar with the document on your left, the evidence assessment? of the document on the right. You don't count. You count. <laughs> you count. You're, you're important to me. But nobody? Okay, so we want to share that with you because it's a plus. What happened this time around is that you had a group of criminal justice researchers look at the President's Task Force recommendations and look for information, evidence, research to support it, to say, well, what does work? Of these 156 recommendations, which ones have got some substance behind them? Which ones can we see are promising? And they were able to narrow it down and give us more clear guidance, allow us to prioritize where we tackle our efforts so that we don't just kind of go with what we think again, but we look for something that science can help us understand and apply and get the results we seek. The other piece, as I kind of precluded a, a little earlier, is that we, they looked at it through a lens of merger. It's not just about crime control, and it's not just about community trust. They looked at what research is out there across the board in either of these realms that could support these recommendations and help agencies then look to something right, evidence-based. There's a lot in there, but we're going to just go over a few. Stacy's going to go over just a couple of the pillars and some of the information we've been starting with um, since this came out. 
So like Ryan said, the original task force report came out with 156 recommendations and agencies took that and went, what am I supposed to do with this? Where do you even start when you have 156 recommendations? Um, in addition to the recommendations, I don't know how many even more there were uh, all these principles and all these things that, and it was just, it became really overwhelming. And so the evidence assessment report kind of really starts to narrow that down and it makes it more digestible. And so we're going to hit on just a few of these that are areas that, uh, that we at CPE kind of provide some support around. And, um, and also we have copies of the evidence assessment, hard copies of it in the back. It's available online as well if you prefer a digital copy. But uh, please, by all means, take a, a hard copy with you um, and for all your friends. So uh, this pillar one, building trust and legitimacy, this has really come up uh, several times throughout the course of, of the summit. And um, the evidence assessment really kind of narrows in on this uh, concept of balancing arrest with a community-oriented approach. Uh, nobody is recreating the wheel here. This kind of concept of a community-oriented approach is, is nothing new. Uh, good cops have been doing this for, um, for ages. And so what they kind of start to point out here are, um, are the benefits of things, like using a, um, a problem-solving approach with community members and how uh, that is more likely to have an impact, a positive impact on reducing crime than uh, just out kind of general arrest practices. Um, pillar two, policy and oversight. Uh, this is where you're gonna start to hear about uh, transparency, and uh, looking out for those um, disproportionate consequences of our enforcement and uh, crime prevention measures. And so this is also where you're gonna start to see some of the uh, concerns around implicit bias coming up and providing uh, training and policies around uh, reducing bias. We're not really gonna cover pillar three, but this is where uh, body cams come up, um, also use of uh, non-lethal weapons, and uh, Pillar 4, so many of these really start to overlap, because Pillar 4 is where we again hit on this, uh, this concept of community policing and crime prevention, and uh, Ryan kind of hit about the, the balance and the back and forth between uh, the importance of those. And so this really covers, again, things that engage the community, um, problem-oriented policing, um, be one of them and uh, enhance communication, especially those de-escalation skills. Uh, pillar five is obviously um, a section that we really do a lot with, and there's way more under pillar five that we could cover. Uh, sort of the gist of pillar five was interesting is they used a lot of research that um, isn't actually from the public safety field, but what they did is they did a lot of research about how people learn and how adults learn in particular, and it talks about how to apply that in training. So this is something that, that we at CPE have uh, embraced and tried to make sure that all of the training that we provide is provided in a way that is um, effective for adults and their learning. Uh, but the one thing we do kind of want to call out under Pillar 5 is that's where, uh, the, where CIT training has landed. And so do you want to talk more about CIT training? So what the evidence assessment pointed out was this was one of the most researched areas of training in public safety. Um, I'll speak to the back end of that statement. But it is one of the most researched areas. It's an area where they've been able to find that what CIT does do is have an effect on, be, on attitudes. Right? It, it's, a, it's a positive training that has been proven to adjust or change the attitude that officers have towards people suffering from mental illness. That's a good thing. That's what we need. If we want to get further down this road of trust, we've got to make adjustments to the way in which we, um, we think about the people that we're interacting with. We've got to attack the stigma. And so it's just a supportive literature, if you will, to say that that's a good thing in that way. Um, and so we've got that going. That's why I say the shameless plug. Is it another part of CP that's not linked into this presentation, but I'll put out there, is that we have two CIT coordinators, one here right in the front with us, that are offering services, training, um, consultation, et cetera, within um, any given agency within in the state, a public safety agency to help either start up CIT, to help support CIT that's already in place, as well as learn more and understand better the, um, 
the, the subjects within your community that are suffering from mental illness or, and or um, crisis. The other side of the kind of the statement that it's the most researched area of training uh, kind of leaves this gaping hole in that there's a, a lot about public safety training that has not been researched or there is not a basis of um, evidence to support it. So what you get is this conundrum of, okay, so how do we know that what we're doing is of any value? Because we do it a lot. We throw training at problems a lot, right? But how do we know that we're getting anything from it? So we've kind of embraced that consideration as well. And so for the few that were in the other room with Steve James, that's an area that we're trying to tackle and look at what, what are some of the things that can be trained and, and back up and determine what things should be trained, whether it be inter, um, engaging with somebody in crisis, whether it be merely interacting with a person on the side of the road, and to include if you're engaged in a, in a high stress, rapidly evolving, deadly force situation. What are the behaviors that need to be trained in an officer so that they have the best chance of having a positive outcome? Not a guarantee, but the best chance of having a positive outcome at the end of that and building training around it, and measuring that to see that training is having the effect that we need. So we've got that kind of going as well to answer the question. So that as we finish the list that you saw there, this document also raises a number of questions like this within all of the pillars as to where more research can be done, where more research should be done before we just barrel on down the road of change for the sake of change or doing it another way because, or a new way because that's what we think we need to do. Um, and training is just one area that we've focused in on. Our efforts then in a nutshell really try to again merge crime control and legitimacy together. And within all of the training that we provide, as Stacy kind of mentioned, and to talk about this link of research to training, as we try to di you know, boil it down, I guess if you will, make it translatable, digestible, um, deliverable, and we've focused everything around this concept of procedural justice, whether it be externally and what you do with the individuals you're engaging with, or whether it's something that you can do internally within your organization or with your peers. Because science, yet again, will point to the fact that every human being responds positively to these things. Right? So if you are wanting someone to go along with what you have to say, you want someone to respect the authority that you have, you can't just rely on the fact that you have it or just demand that they do what you ask. Procedural justice really provides the basis or the language to say, no, people need a voice. They need the opportunity to share their side of the equation. They want the respect that everybody deserves. We all have this innate resistance to disrespect, right? We don't like the feeling of that, and it affects our behavior, so we need to be cognizant of it. Neutrality, right? We want to engage in something where we know that not only is our voice heard, but it will be, um, you know, taken in without a filter, or as, as few filters as possible, right? This is where we try to eliminate biases. This is where we try to kind of rely on things that are objective or impartial, like the law. And then trustworthiness, that actions, right? We look for cues from other people and we, we respond to actions that demonstrate to us that, you know, what's said will get done, right? That what we're looking for will be provided from the individual. So we provide a great deal of training that infuses this concept, like I said, externally or internally, and we've called it our legitimacy module or, or our, our approach to legitimacy. Legitimacy, again, being just that, um, I guess, belief. It's really more, nothing more than a perception that the person in authority has that authority or that you'll provide them response to that authority. And traditional, not tradition, that's not the right, right word to use, but most recently, everybody focuses in just on the individual interactions. How do I talk to Annie? and gain legitimacy. And that's a good thing. And we provide training around those topics exactly, individual interactions and how we improve those. But we've broadened our modules to include then also the culture of the officers themselves and their conduct within you know, the, the agency and their peers. How are they engaging with one another? How do they hold one another accountable? Right? 
how do they provide procedural justice to them with each other as well as the people that they serve so that there's this perception yet again, right? We're back to the perception that they should be the ones to hold us accountable in the community because they hold each other accountable within their own culture and, and community. One more rung out, we see that research-informed decision-making is a huge piece of legitimacy as well. This is where you get actions and operations in an agency that community members right, can respect because it's being done objectively, because it's based on something like science that isn't about one person or another person or a group or another group or a preference. It's vetted out the variables to say, yep, this is what's going to work. And this is how you might move forward. So we teach a class on research-informed decision-making that brings to the table a lot of this information as well so that at an agency level or at the operation level, again, you can seek or you can maintain legitimacy by choosing actions that are um, objective. So running through a few of these trainings then, they're, they're titled exactly like what you just saw. We have a, a police legitimacy and procedural justice class. It's a one-day course that can be condensed either into four hours of training, or ideally we like to provide the full eight hours of training. We, DPSST, are able to come out and provide that within the agency itself, or we offer it um, back at, at home, if you will, here in Salem at the academy grounds. We've taken this course and we've put it into um, all of the levels of training we provide on site. So our basic students receive training on procedural justice, our um, leadership levels, so your supervisors, your brand new supervisors receive this training, your middle managers receive this training as well. What else we got on the board? And then we have a facilitator course. Stacy made the, the point there that what we'd love to see is not just that you rely on DPSST to come and get this information, but that you kind of buy into it and we'd be happy to just share it and train you up on how to give it um, back to your own community. We've got some great contacts that way. We've already provided this training um, in partnership with the agency itself across the entire department of Central Point Police. We are halfway through Prineville Police. Corvallis Police is scheduled for November, or pardon me, April. And we have a number of other agencies as well where it's not DPSST coming and training them up and then hoping they remember it's the agency gaining the knowledge, learning how to facilitate the course, and fostering that, um, that type of thinking, that kind of training, hopefully for the long, the long term. We figure the formula works, so we applied the same to the ethics training. Now, a little more specifically on ethics, just for your awareness, it's not just about, hey, don't do that stuff, and you tell on each other when you do or they don't. Um, we really try to bring science into this equation as well and talk a lot about how human beings make decisions, particularly those, um, those non-conscious decisions or reactions that occur and how that can take you down that slippery slope of ethics uh, or unethical decision making. Um, we again wrap it back into the conversation about what kind of legitimacy you're creating within your department and how that then plays out within the community that you serve. And again, we have the ethics train the trainer course as well so that the same can be done. Uh, just so the folks in public safety know, you have a standard coming out that's going to require that you do ethics training at least you know, three, hour, or three hours in a three-year period. This is a great way, of course, to establish that. What you'll get, I can assure you, if you've met Dr. Weiniger, you know, you're going to get probably years' worth of maintenance training on ethics out of the three-day course because it's, it's, it's packed with information and it allows agencies to then select the pieces of that puzzle that they want to share with their class or their agency over each part of the year or each year that they choose. Last one then is the research-informed decision-making. So I, I think we've, we've covered this well enough. Again, it's a single-day module that we're well, we bring out or we'll be happy to put together a train-to-trainer course on. This is where we kind of infuse those conversations of what, what is research, what is good research, where do we find it, how is it valuable to us, and what can it do, how can we use it to drive the decisions we make and the operations that we choose to move forward with in our organization. Last thing I'll say before I, I think I'm done, I can hand it over to Stacy, is that I know we put a big emphasis on policing, of course it's in our title, but we offer this to all uh, public safety in the state. 
So these trainings are not just for police officers. Legitimacy is a concept that only applies to police. It applies to parole and probation corrections. Right? And these are all available through DPSST for any of those um, areas. And we've also invited community partners as well to participate. We just had a great interaction earlier this week bringing in a, um, pardon me, a reform advocate out of Portland and they were a part of our legitimacy training which just brings a whole nother perspective both for the police officers and for the advocates to understand and learn and work together on these issues. So going back to uh, thinking about how um, crime prevention efforts contribute to legitimacy, one of the other areas that we provide support in is through uh, helping agencies to build their capacity for problem solving. And uh, we do this through uh, a, a couple of ways. One, we host the Problem Oriented Policing Conference that will be in the fall. Uh, we don't have dates yet for this year's, but it should be kind of at the uh, end of November, early December. And, um, and then we, um, we provide scholarships and we're gonna send, I don't know, five people or so, I think this year to the National Problem Oriented Policing Conference as well. And, uh, and this year, the, um, the 2016 conference, the director of the National Center came to Oregon and was our, um, was our guest for our local conference. So um, one of the things that we, we cover uh, both at the basic academy and um, through this trying to help provide and increase the capacity is this concept of problem solving. And so uh, the problem solving model, uh, the, the Sarah model down here at the bottom, is, uh, is a model that was created to kind of help I express the idea of, um, of completing a problem-oriented policing project. And um, I don't think there's much to say about that. I wish I had the dates for you for the conference. Um, but what can we do to help you to be a resource? In addition to the conference and the national conference, oh, I thought I had another one here. Then uh, we can be a support for you guys in, um, in helping you with your pop problems in your agency. And so recently, an example came up with, um, can we use them, Staten? If they don't mind, I guess they're not here. Um, State and PD contacted us. They had come to the POP conference. Uh, they had a community problem that uh, turns out was really unique. And uh, they went through the POP conference and they, they got some ideas and they went back to their community and they tried to tackle this problem and found that uh, they were just not being effective. And so they contacted us and said, we're, we're kind of lost. We don't know what to do with this. And so we were really excited to, um, to help tackle a, a real life problem. And so a bunch of us kind of jumped on it and started helping them out, looking for resources. Uh, and their problem, so many, if um, some people in this room probably came to the POP conference, uh, a really popular topic this year at the POP conference was agencies dealing with these zombie houses or houses that have been abandoned, uh, squatters have moved in, uh, trying to, to clean these properties up, trying to get these people out of the houses. And, uh, and this situation in Staten is really almost a reverse problem. What we have in Staten is we have uh, this uh, property owner that will not maintain property. And so there are 15 families living in this property that is um, in complete disarray and the police department has really taken ownership of this is their community and this is an important problem to them that they want to help solve and so they've done things like i mean at christmas time or this uh, winter they went and bought space heaters for all of the families that live there i mean they're trying you know to be really creative and, and desperate to help these families that are in this situation and so uh, Annie, who's our, um, our researcher, and we'll talk more about her here in a few minutes, kind of jumped on looking at, you know, what, what kind of strategies possibly can, can we use. And so she's been working with, uh, with the, the chief there about, you know, have you guys tried this? Have you tried this? Have you tried this? And then uh, we think that we're getting close to helping them figure out a resolution to this, this situation. So hopefully, and then... Um, I'll talk more about kind of the follow-up to that when I get to microgrants. 
Uh, so one of the things that we do is in support, and one of the things that Annie does is helping agencies with research. So when Staten comes to us and says, we don't know what else to do with this, uh, Annie is really good at finding research and finding solutions. And so Annie spends all of her time looking at research and translating it for agencies, uh, taking these you know 45 page documents and making it a really usable like one page, here's the highlights, here are the things that, that you need to know. Um, so this is a list that she's put together of places we talked about, you know, how do you even know where to go and find good research? There's tons of it out there. If you Google something, you're going to find a million sources, but that doesn't mean that they're good ones. And so here's some examples of ones that, um, that are good uh, that we use on, uh, on a regular basis. I think that Oregon Knowledge Bank we've probably talked about um, or has come up. At this point, if anyone doesn't know the Knowledge Bank, I guess I would be surprised. It's all, it's all over here. Um, our partners at Portland State, uh, National Resources, the Center for Evidence-Based Crime Policy also is a good resource of providing one-pagers. So they also are doing similarly to what we're doing, taking these big uh, pieces of research and they're translating it, making it digestible. Here's one page, here's what you need to know on this topic because one page is, is good, right? That's what you said. Uh, knowledge Bank, um, in case somebody uh, has been under a rock for a few days, uh, is a great resource of, of local. What's happening here in Oregon? So agencies are submitting, this is a, 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 pro a problem that we had in our community, this is a solution that we tried, and this is what happened as a result of it. So it's a great source for you guys to go to when you're trying to tackle a problem in your own community. What do I do with this problem? Well, first let's see, what have other people tried? And the Knowledge Bank will provide you uh, contacts so you can reach out to those people and go, uh, can you give me more information about this? What did you do? Um, it will also, people will point out, you know, areas that they struggled and barriers and, and how they overcame some of those. So this is the point that I wanted to get to about kind of following up with the state and project is how else can we be a resource? And this is something that um, Obviously, I'm, I'm really excited about So we have a partnership with the Criminal Justice Commission, and they gave us uh, a chunk of money to, uh, to support you guys. And so we do this through our microgrant program. This kind of goes back to, at the very beginning, we had the pyramid of the no do be, and this is where we start moving into, into the do, and hopefully uh, that will help move people into the be. So... We have this pot of money that we can grant out to agencies to help you guys implement a solution to a problem in your community. And uh, we are, um, we're looking to do this with Staten. So once we have really analyzed what the problem is and came up with a solution, then we're hoping to use a microgrant to help pay to, uh, to get their solution implemented. And so it's, uh, it's nice in the sense that it's a grant, but also it's not as um, overwhelming as it would be for an agency, a local agency, to go out and, uh, and apply for a grant. There are certainly some, some hoops, or it's a grant, you have to jump through some hoops, but we've tried to keep this really simple. We want this to be a resource for, for our constituents. We want you guys to think strategically about solutions and, and what you might be able to implement in your community and how we might be able to help support you in that. Um, so these are some of the categories that we um, kind of fund. These are some of the broad categories. It's not just policing. So we are funding um, community corrections programs, uh, corrections, crime prevention, um, so in addition to uh, Staten, hopefully when we come up with, with the right solution for that, that program, uh, hopefully uh, Bend, I see Bend sitting back here in the corner, and they're working on lots of great pop projects that hopefully we will be able to help them implement uh, soon. Uh, we funded um, Marion County, Marion County Sheriff's Office, um, some of you might have sat through some of the lead uh, presentations that have gone on yesterday and today. And Marion County is one of those agencies that's looking at implementing le lead. And so uh, through a micro grant, we're going to help them with the um, cost of a consultant that's going to help them kind of get that program up and running and off the ground. Uh, Almsville PD is another one that um, they were having some problems in the summertime with uh, lots of car break-ins. 
and uh, thinking really strategically what could they do to implement that. And what they decided to do was to create a, um, a bicycle patrol. And so through a microgrant, we're going to help them kind of get that program off the ground. You know, the caveat is that they actually have to do some measurement and see did it impact crime? Did they, will they, this summer, during our measurement period, will they reduce the number of, car, of car prowls that happen in their community or not? Yes. We do. So uh, I am their support, <laughs> as is Annie now. And so uh, it's um, because we're trying to keep it simple. Um, you guys don't have time to do this. You don't have time to look at research, and you don't have time to translate it, and you don't have time to write a grant and jump through 100 hoops. And so we tried to keep it really simple in the reporting. So one of the things that we do during the application process is to help them identify what is it we really need to know. What are, what are the outcomes, and how are we going to look and see whether it worked or not. And so that's definitely something that we do, provide technical support to help them come up with that. Um, and this is just a little more about funding priorities. Obviously, our, our big focus areas are on things that um, are related to crime prevention and also things that will improve community livability. And so this state and example is, is one of those. It's a, it, this is a community livability issue, and it's really important to the police department. They're involved in their community, and they want this to, to be better, and, um, and we're working with them to try to help make that happen. Um, because this is all about what works and evidence-based practices, we would like you guys to tie these proposals to research. We would like you to be strategic in thinking about your solution. Um, is, is there research out there that supports that this is um, even a promising uh, approach? Uh, there might not be research because you might come up with something that nobody has tried. And we want to support that as well. And so part of the, this kind of coming full circle is that once you've tried something and um, had some results, positive or, or not, we want you to share it with others. And so then we want you to, to submit it to the Knowledge Bank so that you can then be a resource. So another agency, when they come up with that problem, can go, oh, I see that these other people did it. How did that work out for you? So in the back of the room, um, in addition to the copies of the evidence assessment, we have a little more of this information about microgrants. So as you guys kind of go back to your agencies and you're thinking about, you know, what agencies your community is facing, um, and you think about it strategically, think about it in a problem-solving method. You really have to do kind of a lot of analysis to make sure. Um, what we often see are that people come with a, to us with solutions, but they haven't really yet identified a problem. And so don't let the cart go before the horse. You really want to make sure that you're being really strategic in, in what your solution is, and then contact us and uh, see if we can help you with that. Anything else about microgrants? So this is our contact information. So I said at the beginning, I'm the storyteller. Um, so I told you the story how we got where we're at right now. We're only three years into this thing. Um, we were asked to promote evidence-based policing. The story I hope we tell, and these services help get us there, right, going back to that triangle of knowing, doing, and being, is that agencies in this state, communities right, across the state, are evidence-based. They are evidence thinkers or evidence-based thinkers, research-informed thinkers, however you want to describe that term because it can get a little cliche. And so you see this cycle of life. That's kind of the joke, the circle of life that we started even singing the songs between us and CJC when we started talking about this. But we've laid down a foundation. We continue to lay down the foundation of where you can go, where, how you can learn the, uh, the information, whether you go to a knowledge bank to find it, you go to a summit like this, a pop conference, or a class that we provide. Then moving on to kind of sparking innovation, sparking thought, you know, in the, in the, the effort to change and supporting that with micro grants, supporting that with JRI um, grants so that action takes place. Right, again, technical support comes in to ensure that research is being consulted, at least is at the table for that 
that decision making for the problem solving, as well as the metrics to see where is it going to go, what's it going to get us. We follow along, we see and whether it works or it doesn't work, it's information that we can all then learn from, we can grow from. And so we take that, we feed it back to the knowledge bank, we feed it out to the rest of the agencies who then can tackle their next problem or they can help someone else or support someone else now dealing with that problem. Right? And what we have is not, I guess, two things. We, the B is a community. That's what we want. We want a statewide community practicing evidence-based policing. So, questions? Figured as much on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> Thank you guys very much for your time and willingness to sit through. Oh. <gasps>